Our next guest is Dr. Aileen Kuru, and we call her Linny. Uh, she, as, as, as Karin spent uh, all those years under, under canvas uh, in the Akavango, Linny spent three years uh, on the Russian steppe with the people, with the nomads, teaching herself Russian in the process of studying this very elusive animal. How many people have ever seen or know a saiga antelope? Okay. Very good. Three or four, that's more than usual. Please welcome Dr. Kuhl. Thank you, Vance. Could I just say I'm very excited to be here and I'm really grateful to ICCF to bring people from the field like Karen and myself together with you here. It's been really inspiring. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, this whole week, um, and I'm really grateful um, to Maggie um, for hosting us. And so, yeah, I'd like to take you from Russia to Central Asia and Russia. Um, from Africa, did I say Russia? So there we are. How does this work? Uh, do I just click on it? No. Yes. Okay, so there we are, completely different part of the world. Um, this, these are Saiga <laughs> down here. The first one you saw was a calf. Um, yeah, so you probably, how you probably came across Central Asia so far in the news has been mostly about oil and gas and there's big political interests in this region, like in Kazakhstan alone you find 99 elements of the uh, um, periodic tables out of the 110 in Kazakhstan alone. So it's an extremely sort of uh, wealthy region in terms of natural resources, but not only oil and gas, um, but also wild places. Um, such as the, the Tian Shan Mountains down here, forests, and I'll be talking about the steppe, um, these temperate grasslands, um, which you get a lot of in, in Central Asia, where the, where the Saiga lives, which is what I spent um, the last five years um, tracking and following um, in Central Asia. So temperate grasslands are a really fascinating part of the world, which have been uh, which haven't received that much attention. So they're not unlike the prairies you get in the United States. Um, some, of, some of the um, fauna is quite similar. And what's striking is, um, so this is, this is the area that I'm talking about. So in Central Asia and in Russia, you get the largest um, undisturbed steppe ecosystem worldwide. But there's been very little effort spent to protect it. So when you look at the protected areas that we have worldwide, we have coral reefs, we have forests, we have mountains but nobody's really sort of looked at grasslands much, so less than 1% of pre protected areas are these temperate grasslands, and these wild open spaces are really important, um, not least for, for migratory species such as the saiga. And saiga have been around for a very long time, so they used to roam the steppes together with, with mammoths, with woolly rhinos, so down here is a, is a, is a rock carving from the Bron Bronze Age, actually, from Kazakhstan. And so, just to give you an idea where saiga bones have been found from the Pleistocene, you even got them here in, in Alaska across the Bering Straits. They used to be incredibly common, millions of them, wide roaming, so they may migrate up to a thousand kilometers north to south. Um, so there used to be a lot of them. And this is a photograph from the um, Kazakh steppe in the 1970s. Um, just to give you, it's a bad picture, but it just gives you an idea of you know, what, it, what it used to look like. But then the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, and that brought unemployment with it. Um, rural economies collapsed, as no doubt you're aware. And so natural resources such as the saiga, which are highly valued, but also um, wild donkeys, birds, you name it, plants, um, were exploited on unprecedented scales. And so out of the ungulates, the hooved animals, um, so like camels or saiga, um, 43 of them are now threatened. Um, and so this is, this is where we find Saiga today. So we've got the Caspian Sea here, Kazakhstan in the middle. So most of you probably heard about Kazakhstan through Borat, I hope, Borat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, should have put a picture out. Um, so in, in the early 90s, so even, even though Borat didn't actually, um, none, of, none of the footage you see is in Kazakhstan, it's Romania actually, but um, okay. So more, more than a million used to run the steps still in 1991, so this is really, really recent. And what we've seen is they have declined on a scale that is, that is really, um, WWF calls this the, the fastest declining um, large mammal species in recent decades. No other large mammals declined on such a scale, 95% collapse within 10 years. Yeah, I really want you to, to take this, if you take any of this, any, anything from this talk, I really want you to take this home you know, 
there's been this massive decline. It's not only Saiga, we happen to have very good data for them, but also, you know, wild donkey, it, like wild ass and so on. And it's, 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 it's a really sort of recent problem and there, there's been very little awareness about it. Um, so, and what's driving it? It's poaching. So we had this um, in Saiga poaching villages in Uzbekistan, we had this competition. Um, this was supposed to be a competition, draw a Saiga, who draws the prettiest Saiga picture? That's what we thought. Um, and this is what some of the children came up with. Um, really, you know, quite gruesome pictures of, of Saiga poaching. We were quite shocked by this, that even, you know, children from the age of 10 to 12, um, this, is, this is how they perceived the Saiga problem. And Saiga are hunted for their horns and for their meat. The horns are used in Chinese traditional medicine. So it's not um, too dissimilar to the, to the rhino story, but unlike the rhino, it's, it's, um, it's an anti-inflammatory drug also used against headaches, and so, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to find alternatives, such as aspirin, for example. Um, and the trouble is that, so, all the, all the saigas you see down here, they're all males, because only the males have got the horn. And so this has led to another problem, which is that the number of males has declined because poachers try and kill males because they're bigger, so you get more meat out of them, but they, you know, they, they bear this precious horn. And so, while some of some of this is some of this sort of decline in males is okay, what we've seen has been a decline in fecundity. So there weren't enough males to mate with all the females. Um, so this point down here, actually, and um, down down at the very bottom, we had less than one percent of adult males in this population, and you know the males just uh, couldn't cope, unfortunately. And so this is you have the direct poaching offtake, and then on top of that, you have this reproductive collapse. Um, and so part of my um, research, my PhD, focused on, 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 on local people because essentially the Saiga problem is a socioeconomic problem. What we found is that unemployment, poverty are the key factors that came out throughout all our survey sites and all the range states um, driving this problem. And what is interesting is that everybody talks about, you know, Saiga are hunted for their horn for Chinese traditional medicine. But when we looked at the income that local um, poaching households have, most of the income comes from saiga meat because saiga males have become so rare and so it's become so difficult to kill a male that they've switched partly to the meat. And this has been ignored in the international policy debate to some extent to focus on this rural meat market. And you know, this is, this, this is really important to look at alternative livelihoods and so on, so this is something I I can't, unfortunately, this talk is too short to elaborate on it, but I'd be happy to talk to you about more. And this is our webpage where you can find out more.